Okay, uh, good morning. Time now a few minutes after 8 o'clock in the morning uh, in Tokyo, Friday, October the 7th, 2022. Welcome to another edition of the uh, online morning seminar organized by the World Bank Tokyo office. My name is Koichi Omori. I am Senior External Affairs Officer of the World Bank based in Tokyo. We organize online uh, seminars to introduce the latest report in timely manner, having the World Bank economists and specialists as a future speaker. Every spring and fall, each of the six regional chief uh, economist offices publish the regional economic updates to capture regional economic trend and key topics with depth analysis. As usual, we are trying to capture all of the six regional reports at our program, starting with East Asia and Pacific region today. We have Elgis Islamaj, senior economist in the office of the chief economist for East Asia and the Pacific, connecting uh, with us from Washington. Good morning, good evening, uh, Elgis. Uh, how are you? Hi, Koichi. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me, as always. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Elgis is now uh, uh, the one of the frequent uh, speakers in our program, uh, presenting the uh, uh, EAP uh, East Asia, uh, the Pacific uh, economic update every time. Uh, we will listen to uh, Ergi's presentation for next uh, 35, 30, 40 minutes, uh, presenting the main findings of the latest edition of the East Asia and the Pacific Economic Update, which is titled this time Reforms for Recovery, released on uh, September 26, last week. Uh, following his presentation, I'll read the questions that we received from our viewers. Thank you very much for sending your question in advance. If you did not have opportunity to send your questions, please do so by uh, using uh, the online form posted on the announcement page of the seminar, or you can simply post your question on the chat section of the YouTube screen. So I'll read your question after keynote presentation by Aegis, asking him to respond. With that, I'd like to ask uh, Aegis to come in and start your presentation formally. Aegis, over to you. Uh, thank you, Koichi, and good morning to everybody in Japan. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure to, to, for this to be one of the first audiences that we present our economic update to outside the bank. Uh, so this time is called Reforms for Recovery, and I'm going to walk you through that, and hopefully I'll convince you that the title uh, is fitting to the contents, to the content of the update. And uh, as always, we try to, to do something uh, different than you know what the word regional update uh, suggests so we do start by giving an overview of what's happening in the region and uh, we, we basically uh, think that this update has three main points one is that the region is growing faster and with lower inflation than other regions in the world but again there's uh, there are differences within the region uh, but and then looking ahead we see three risks to longer term growth. One is a deceleration from the global economy. Another one is the growing debt that is lowering the fiscal space in this economy. And the third one, which is uh, basically our more of our topic of this update, is the distortions that have come. Uh, well, some of these are long standing distortions, but uh, the, the recent actions of some governments to fight price increases are adding to those distortions, and we argue that uh, those will always hurt longer term growth. Um, and then we, we also more argue rather than, than give like a full proof that more efficient so social protection and better policies, especially uh, in the areas of food, fuel and finance could soften the pain today while also boosting growth tomorrow. So uh, let me start by walking you through what, what we usually uh, note as the, as the recent denote as the recent developments. And basically the, the three upcoming themes of this recent development section is growth, inflation, and disease. So first, what is going on with growth? And this is what, what, what everybody is, is really keen to know about. Uh, is, I mean, I think the IMF is gonna come out later this week, but we, we've seen headlines. Is, is, the, is the global economy going to decelerate? How is that affecting the region? Uh, what is going on with China? Uh, all these things are, are, of course, subject to update. Uh, and then what, when we put the data together, what we see is that most of the major economies of developing East Asia and Pacific are projected to grow faster 
and have lower inflation than many other economies in the world in 2022. So uh, basically what, what I said uh, can, can be seen in the upper left quadrant where I put the circle here, which basically on the vertical axis you have growth, so high is high growth, and uh, on the horizontal axis you have inflation, so low is low inflation, both of them are actually good. Uh, now, looking at the data, what is going on is we see that, uh, again, most of the EAP economies have recovered from, from the effects of, of the pandemic, and uh, of course, this pandemic came in waves, so now we, we distinguish between uh, basically what happened in the middle of last year, which was the delta wave of the pandemic, and then what happened at the end of last year, and, and it went on during this year, which was the Omicron. And the Omicron reached China later. So if you remember, uh, last year in 2021, China grew by as much as 8.1%. And, and, uh, and then by the time we said that China and Vietnam and a couple of other economies have recovered from the pandemic and, and you know, they're, they're going on, of course, uh, this high number reflects a little bit of a, of a rebound from slower growth the year before. But again, it, 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 was, it was a strong recovery after the pandemic. Well, the rest of the region, they were facing, they were, they were mainly uh, struggling with a, with a Delta variant of COVID-19. It, it grew slowly, uh, and the average number for the region was 2.6 percent growth in 2021, and for the Pacific Island was a negative number. But now going in 2021, so after suffering through Delta, it seems like all these major economies in the region, excluding China, were uh, either better equipped or, or, or more comfortable uh, handling or, or living with Omicron. And then during Omicron, they didn't see a lot of disruptions. At the same time, a lot of, uh, you know, their domestic demand uh, came out stronger than, you know, we thought it was going to be earlier in the year. And they have actually seen stronger growth boosted by uh, strong domestic demand, as I'm going to show in a couple of minutes. But China continued is a uh, zero COVID approach. And they, they used, of course, targeted, but they used this, uh, this uh, stringent public health measures. And that constrained or is constraining economic activity in 2022. Uh, therefore, our prediction for China is uh, only 2.6% growth for this year. Now, to convince you that about what, what I said, we see that the private consumption, especially, uh, has been strong in 2022 for the major economies in the region, right? And again, th th this was because they, uh, once, you know, they, they, they believed or they felt comfortable living with Omicron, they lifted a lot of these mobility restrictions that they had in place and that allowed, uh, you know, the economy or at least the cons consumption to, to grow and add to that a lot of pent up demand that was there because of the lockdowns uh, in earlier years that contributed to strong consumption in 2022. At the same time, the region continued. So uh, one thing I didn't say here is that if you look at, if you notice in China, the, in the second quarter of 2022, consumption really didn't contribute much to growth. Actually, it was a negative contribution. Sorry. Uh, and, and then at the same time, the, the region continued to benefit from uh, strong goods exports. So again, we the caveat here, we see that coming down in the last couple of months, but in the first half of the year, you know, the, the, the demand from for goods, especially, uh, it's an especially manufacturing goods that are produced in East Asia, the, the demand in, in the Western economies in the US and, and Europe continue to stay strong and uh, the rest of the region, uh, they were able to, to export to those economies. We were not saying that this is this will continue to happen in the future, but so far in the past that has contributed to growth. And then, uh, because you know some economies like Thailand and the Philippines, uh, and also Malaysia, they they uh, lifted the restrictions, and some of these restrictions were were negatively affecting tourism in the past. Now they are they are trying to see a rebound in tourism. So basically, the services exports also grew and benefited to growth in these economies. And in, uh, in the countries like the Philippines, especially with the electoral cycle that happened there, they also saw some push from government consumption. So add this together, and we have this, you know, strong demand in the region, which actually, you know, is seeing growth, or is as if 
growth in those countries is not being affected from what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, and on the other hand, China combination of factor is seeing uh, growth slow down. Again, it's not negative, but it's slowing down. To going back to China, uh, what happened there is uh, these recurrent outbreaks, and we know looking at these available measures of of stringency. Uh, you, you can you can see you can see very 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 clearly that there is a divergence of this the stringency of mobility restrictions uh, in China and in the rest of the world and also in the rest of EAP. And this chart here, but also some more in, you know analytical work that we did in the update, suggests that uh, this this stringency, especially during the Omicron wave, have affected exports, industrial production, sales. And, and also uh, manufacturing and, and services production. So we attribute a lot of what's happening to, to basically the, the different approaches that, that uh, these economies had towards COVID. Therefore, the, the disease heading in, in, in the very first slide. Now, having said all this, there's this you know, strike difference in numbers, in, in the growth rate numbers between China and the rest of the region. I do want to put it out there uh, that because of China's stronger earlier recovery, it's compared to pre-pandemic, its output has increased more than other uh, economies in the region. So again, China is seeing slower growth now, but uh, we, we shouldn't uh, basically forget the, the, the very strong recovery that they had in the year right after the pandemic. Now, this is what happened in the in the first half of 2022 now looking forward what do we see well we see three risks to grow the first risk comes through slowing global growth so now again i apologize here that there is uh, that there is a lot of things that uh, you know are about to be released soon, but we, we were not able to release them in this, in this update. And among them is basically what's going on with the global economy. Uh, the World Bank releases the, the, the projection for the global economy in June and in, uh, in uh, January. And then in October and in April, they, they release the projections for, I mean, each region releases a projection for the regional economy. So because there is a discrepancy in time, uh, when this update was published, we used this we of World Economic Outlook projections from July, which basically uh, compared their July forecast, their, their April forecast with July forecast, and they showed a downgrade. Now, uh, Tuesday morning, so this next week, we will again release their global projections. And uh, I think there was an article in, in the Financial Times today that from, from the Kisalina uh, Georgieva, basically the, the, the managing director of the IMF, uh, kind of hinting that those projections will not, not be good, will again, you know, either they're going to downgrade them further or they're going to st stick to these downgrades that they did later. So whatever we're saying here is likely going to be true. So we expect a slowing global growth uh, for the remaining of 2022 and especially in 2023. Our analytical work shows that this, uh, this slowing global growth will negatively affect growth in the region. Add to that potential slowdown in China, and you know, basically we can expect the, the uh, spillovers, the negative spillovers for the rest of the region to be as big as one percentage point to their growth going forward. The, the second risk that in the list that, that I mentioned um, comes from rising prices and interest rates, right? So in inflation, we again, this is again, kind, of, kind of an exogenous shock for the region because it's coming from the rest of the world, but we see like a combination of say uh, strong demand in, in the US uh, due, due to stimulus, uh, but more importantly, all these uh, supply problems, basically the, the supply chain disruptions and the, the increase in commodity prices 
after you know the, the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine from Russia, s uh, provoked an inflation in the U.S. and in the, in the other advanced economies. This prompted, you know, the, the central banks, the Fed, and other central banks to react by increasing interest rates. What this means for emerging markets means uh, basically capital going for higher, higher and safer yields in, in advanced economies in the US and maybe in, the, in other parts of Europe. And it means the, basically capital out, outflows, which put pressures on exchange rates. And, and that is what we, what, what we saw or what, what we see is happening. And this is something that a lot of countries in the region are worried about. I mean, we still haven't seen like the domino effect of the previous crisis, it, and that's for good reasons because a lot of economies in the region have good fundamentals. But definitely, this, uh, these pressures are are depreciating the uh, or are putting depreciation depreciation pressures on exchange rates of countries in the region. Uh, combined with uh, supply chain disruptions of their own, they're they're adding to to price increases in the region. And uh, what this means is that it will necessitate some some response from the economics in the region to to deal with these price pressures, and that will be bad for growth. Now, uh, this is happening not in the best of situations, and the reason I'm saying that is because what we saw uh, during the pandemic, we saw that debt already increased, and then as now. So an increased debt that happened during the pandemic lowers fiscal space for these countries in the region. On the other hand, what is happening now is higher interest rates, right? To match the increasing interest rates growth, basically to, 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 put, some, to put some lead on, on the capital outflows, and at the same time to fight inflation abroad, in, at least in a few countries that is happening. Now, what higher interest rates in the countries in the region means uh, is basically higher debt service, uh, higher, uh, you know, if you if you want to refinance debt, higher cost of refinancing uh, debts, and uh, this is especially problematic in countries that have a high rate of variable interest rate debt, or if they have debt external debt denominated in foreign currency, where basically as their exchange rate depreciates, the value of their debt becomes higher. Uh, you know, again, looking at the countries in the region, we, we provide a lot of detail in the, in the update. In, the, in this respect, Laos and Mongolia stand out because they were already struggling with, with uh, high debt business even, even before this latest crisis started. And they also have large shares of debt at variable rates and denominated in, in foreign currency. But overall, this growing debt service is constraining further fiscal space for economies in the region, and uh, it is limiting uh, spending or expenditure in infrastructure, health, and education, which again is not good for longer term growth. Now, the last risk that, that we see basically it's like these clouds that are gathering the, into this, this uh, in the horizon is that uh, a lot of, we see quite some use of price controls to fight inflation. And while, you know, at least in the, in, in the short term, uh, there's probably, you know, some, some good reason to say that, hey, these price controls have contributed to keeping a lead on inflation. And remember back to the first slide, that inflation in the region uh, in 2022 is, is likely to be less than, on average, less than in other countries in, in the world. Uh, now, these controls on prices while help dampen inflation in the short term, and also they help households and businesses. But what, what they also do, and this is something we worry about, and we spend a lot of time in the update discussing about, is that they muddy the price signals. And this is happening into, in a post-COVID world where resource flows need clear direction. So this is the third risk, especially 
the actions of government now are adding to existing distortions uh, and that, that might uh, basically hurt reallocation of resources again in the future or longer term growth. So, what can we say and what is the, the status and, and uh, what is our thinking about these policy distortions? And these policy distortions, can, some of them are new, they are in response to these inflationary pressures that we're seeing, and some of them were old, they were already existing in the, in the region, so it's not that the region suddenly wake up and start doing this. Uh, it, what we do in the update and what I'm going to talk to you about, we basically focus specifically on the areas of food, fuel, and also finance, right? In food and fuel is because what is happening with in the commodity markets is basically uh, making some of these government reacts to protect with the, you know, the intention of protecting consumers and businesses, and also in finance because the financial markets are uh, have, have have run some turmoil also in the past, and add to that all the all, all the leniency in the financial markets that was done since the pandemic started, and uh, there's a real risk risk that uh, you know finance is not really playing its role in allocating uh, the resources most efficiently. So, first before we we start talking about that, let's let's talk a little bit about these consumer subsidies. Like you know what is the region doing and how they're approaching it. And we're going to start with an example from Thailand. So some simulations that were done by our, by our poverty team is uh, showing, for example, that uh, in, in order to, to put a lead on, on the cost that these price changes would have on consumers, uh, Thailand partly reacted by, by uh, implementing some fuel subsidies. And uh, th this are this were of, of the of value of 11.1 billion Thai baht, and these fuel subsidies now this this go this benefit everyone in the economy, not just the poor, right? Uh, they they were able to alleviate poverty, and uh, the estimation from from our team was about one percentage point. At the same time, they also uh, you know continued. They had to spend money through their cash transfer program, and uh, that is estimated to be around 2.6 billion. So notice that it's much less than the money spent on fuel subsidies, and that also had, like, if you if we look carefully at these bars, these two different colors, the cash transfer probably had a, a larger impact on poverty. It's not surprising because they were more targeted, and uh, they targeted the poor. They were more effective. If we were, and this is a hypothetical scenario simulation, if we were to take all this money that was spent on fuel subsidies and cash transfers and put them all into this cash transfer program that target poor, then the impact on poverty would have been much, much higher than it's now. Uh, so theoretically, or at least you know, if, if we had the option to do it efficiently, income transfers are preferable to price regulations or subsidies because they do not distort choices. Uh, they can be targeted to those that are most in need and, and also cost less. Now, if we look again, again, this is a, an example from Thailand. Uh, when you look at these cash transfers, they basically, you know, because they, they were given based on their income, they, they were given to uh, consumers ac across different income deciles. And even though, for example, it made up in proportion more of the income of the poor, but you know, everybody benefited. Now, when you look at how much people across income deciles benefited from, from uh, these uh, subsidies, from these fuel subsidies, then we see that the richer, Households who basically um, probably use more cars, they, 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 they saw more benefits of that. And also, when you look at this, uh, this SWC coverage, basically stands for the coverage of the social welfare program. If you look at the social welfare program, I mean, we talk about targeting, but it's not really only given 
to the poor. And actually, you know, if you, if you look at the coverage, only 40%, this is the, the right hand side axis, only 40% of the, the most poor are covered. And that goes down as, as we move uh, up the, 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 the income scales. Now, why do, government, why do governments choose fuel subsidies? So it seems like looking at the first slide, it looked like it looked like the no-brainer that they should go for for cash transfer rather than subsidies, but we see them using fuel subsidies and in other cases price control, as I showed in another in an earlier slide. Well, the first reason might be uh, because the you know the, the infrastructure for targeting might not be perfect, and therefore can exclude eligible households that really need. Help. So for that reason, while they continue to, to improve on, on the infrastructure, they choose to different ways to, to protect to protect the poor, especially. Uh, another reason can be a political economy reason. That you know when when you do these targeting programs, you 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 think about those those that are at the poverty line, but we all we know that there are these people just above the poverty lines line that maybe they are not part of the program. But they might uh, very easily fall down the poverty line if they get, uh, you know, even a small shock or, or price increase that that will that will hurt their their uh, purchasing power. Uh, another reason might be, uh, basically, what we refer to as industrial policy that stable prices can shield firms from rising costs of production, and then by by doing so, they they are actually uh, the governments are. Trying not to allow disruptions in production in supply, but they're trying to keep these firms going, and that might be beneficial for the economy. And uh, another fourth reason that we identify is that uh, in in some emerging markets, for example, uh, the monetary authorities are not credible to fight inflation, and if they let the prices fluctuate and, and focus on on giving transfer to, to those most in need, uh, those uh, those increased prices feed into inflation expectations, de-anchoring them, and uh, the, then, then the, the, it becomes like, like a, the, 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 basically uh, they, they feed into inflation in the next period. So to keep inflation in check, the, some, some governments may choose to basically react with subsidies uh, to make sure that uh, there are no uh, distortion in the, in the, in the macro environment. Now, having said that, uh, we go to, to look a little more carefully at, at what is happening and also what was happening in the markets for food, fuel, and finance. So if we look at uh, the markets for fuel, now, looking at, at the support that these countries are giving to agriculture, what you note is that you know, the support is actually higher, significantly higher than in uh, other OECD countries. Including in Japan and the EU, and uh, this was this came a little bit of a surprise to us. And, and again, we collaborated with with our uh, with our teams and the World Bank. Uh, I think none of us was uh, was an agriculture economics per se. But w when you think about these subsidies in agriculture, you always think Europe. You always think that oh, you, you know, Europe is giving all, all these subsidies, and and this is affecting you know the free trade. But actually, uh, you know, it's countries like Indonesia, Philippines, and China that that. Uh, that are spending twice that from the countries in the region. At the same time, when we look a little more carefully, is that a lot of these subsidies, so basically that's what these figures say, I'll try to walk you through them, uh, are, are targeting production, right? So they, 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 and, and, they, and they especially target, uh, target production of rice, and in some cases, other wheats. Uh, so the, 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 there is this, this rice-centric Production in agriculture uh, and is not necessarily going to nutritious foods. And if we look at the demand for for other nutritious foods, we see that over time that has increased, and the demand for the internal demand for consuming rice has decreased. Uh, so by by keeping these subsidies in, in production, in, in in irrigation intensive production, and basically in in purchasing fertilizers that will that will enhance the, the production of rice, uh, they they are they are distorting the markets for food, and they are also contributing to nutrition security because, you know, they, these guys now, they have to rely on, on uh, imports for more nutritious foods that they might prefer. 
So uh, what would be pre preferable in, in the markets for food is, is a general shift from governments from, from a more eccentric food security to nutrition security. And this means reducing subsidies and trade barriers that, that favor the production of rice and other wheats and to encourage diversified production of more nutritious foods. Uh, and of course, you know, they also should think about uh, encouraging higher productivity and greater sustainability rather than uh, subsidies that, that merely uh, encourage the volume of, of producing some of some of these crops. Moving to, to the to, to the energy subsidies. Uh, again, they, they have increased recently, especially, you know, they are noticeable in countries like uh, Indonesia and, and uh, Malaysia, but not only. And, and what what was uh, what was actually noticeable to us was that especially these two countries, but also other economies like, like Vietnam, they had actually tried in the last few years to lower this, uh, this fossil fuel subsidies. And once this crisis started, that they have to, to increase them. So they are uh, spending money again on fossil fuels, but not on more renewable forms of, of energy production. Now, if, if, we, if we try to think like what, what, what will happen you know, in, the, in these markets of, of fossil fuel uh, consumption and production, and also uh, what does that mean for, for production of, of more renewable energy, or cleaner energy? So let, let, let's think this, is, this was the, the, the price of producing coal. Again, these are some simulation, but based on, on trying to match uh, whatever we know about these markets, we look at, at, at prices of existing coal, which is what is there already, and new coal, basically meaning putting more money in infrastructure of, of producing and extracting more coal. Uh, now, this is how it looked like before, before you know, this shocks in prices of coal, uh, you know, the comparison be between focus on this two, the, this, this new wind and new solar, these are the renewable, the cost of, of producing renewable energy versus the, the, the cost of coal. And there was a case we can make the coal is more efficient, so what can we do? Uh, how, how can we incentivize more either the research or development in, in these renewable forms of energy to make them more efficient or basically directly influencing their costs to make the transition easier. Now, one of the, I guess, from this point of view, good things that happened in 2022 was an increase in, in the price of, of, this, of this dirty fuels to dirty forms of producing energy uh, like coal. Now, when you look at it at that first uh, look, it, 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 and there's an argument that has been made before that, okay, this is encourage more production in, uh, in renewable. Well, uh, it, it, in the, at the margin it will, but we're not there yet. And the reason we're not there yet is because there are this, uh, these backup costs of renewable actually to to operate uh, new wind or, or solar, you need, you need basically back up gas. And given that the, back, that the gas price increased, you know, it also increased the cost of this renewable. And then add to that the fact that these renewable energy sources are more capital intensive and they will re require financing at higher costs. And then this, uh, the, the, this, uh, advantage that you know, this renewable had over at least new coal, forget about the existing coal, it's, uh, it, it's, it's suddenly gone. So this is also something that governments should think about and try to see what they can do. Like one thing, if we take this graph literally, is basically that, you know, subsidizing finance might, 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 might uh, put an, uh, give, give an advantage to renewables over new coal. Again, uh, what the existing coal is there, is, 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 an, is an existing a cheap form of energy that you know they, they can use, especially in crises like this. But we don't want basically to, to time more money to put more money in new coal. That would be the worst case scenario. Uh, so subsidizing renew renewable energy will uh, will in, in, in encourage investment there and be beneficial. Uh, and uh, this also would help because I mean it's not just cost benefits short-term cost-benefit uh, analysis, although these are for looking ahead, uh, but it will also reduce exposure 
to fossil fuels and the volatility of the fossil fuel prices. And also it will make the it will help the economies move towards uh, cleaner energy, which is which is consistent with the goals that many governments have committed to. And then the, the third pillar is the financial sector. So as I said, financial sector uh, you know has seen a lot of uh, of leniency since the pandemic started. We don't see those risks being reflected in, in the official NPL numbers. Uh, and also the banks in the region seems to be well capitalized. But you know, when we look at other measures of profitability, solvency, and liquidity of the banking sector, for example, uh, we see that the risks loom there. So we should be careful because uh, uh, I mean we need to identify the problems that lurk behind you know some of some of these uh, forbearance measures during the pandemic. And we should prevent the emergence of zombie firms uh, because what, what will happen, they will encourage the misallocation of credit. Uh, now, in, in addition to, to, this, uh, to, to, to these policies and in these specific areas, more generally, uh, we, we argue that while these inefficient uh, interventions could actually magnify price shocks, which is basically this, the third bar here, Better policies uh, to then boost investment and also increase TFP, so better deeper reforms, could have could offset the negative impacts of these reforms. And as we've said in previous updates, that's something that uh, the government should not let go. So thank you very much. I I hope I didn't take too long, but I welcome any questions. Thank you, uh, Ergis, for uh, your presentation, including a very uh, up-to-date uh, uh, information uh, on uh, what's uh, going on in the region. Um, we uh, we received uh, several uh, questions in advance, uh, and so let me uh, read uh, those questions asking you to respond. But uh, meanwhile, uh, we we'll, uh, certainly welcome uh, questions uh, from the viewers uh, coming in, uh, even uh, from now. Uh, so please send your question uh, by using the uh, online form posted on the announcement page, or you can simply uh, post your question directly on the uh, uh, YouTube uh, question, uh, YouTube chat section. Uh, so let me uh, read the first uh, question. Um, the, while uh, countries in the region have been focusing on their fight against the pandemic, was it true that the countries had less physical space and could not uh, could not spare enough resources for basic infrastructure or safety net, etc.? If so, this must be a concern for a long term. Uh, how should the countries in the region do? Ergis, uh, any uh, reaction uh, to this question? Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Koichi. Thank you for for the question. We were asked it. I think this is a this is a very important question, and, and uh, it is something that uh, we have actually struggled with in the past updates as well. So in in the past updates, we we used to have uh, this decomposition of uh, of COVID related spending, uh, and basically we would see. So first we noticed two things. First that starting so as far as as the end of last year. So in 2021, we saw that you know that the the fiscal spending, especially COVID related, was decreasing. So suggesting that the fiscal space was weighing on the countries in the region, uh, and this was happening while the output gaps still existed, and they still exist today. We show this in this update. Uh, the, the second the second thing that we noticed is that uh, you know the lot of spending was not happening on say infrastructure spending or on, uh, on spending that uh, on public investment basically spending that uh, could potentially contribute to future growth um, so we we had we had this framework that uh, you know how how should fiscal policy react and what should be the goal of fiscal policy and uh, our basic idea is that while there is a crisis, like there is the, the pandemic, or you know this. Um, depending on on how how bad uh, the the existing turmoil ends up being for the region, 
the first priority is, is to make sure that to provide relief for people. Uh, of course, ideally, especially you know, as the economy is recovered, this should happen in a more targeted way. And, uh, and as they do that, uh, without losing track of uh, spending that can help future growth. So uh, spending on public works, on shovel-ready projects, or, or, or bringing forward plans that, that, that they had, uh, that they had uh, already made uh, rather than waiting for several years could help growth. In the meantime, it is, uh, it, you know, it's basically arithmetics that, that the fiscal space will constrain and as debt increases, will raise questions about the sustainability of debt in these countries. Uh, one positive news is that, you know, these countries have been fiscally prudent. There, there's, there is less fiscal space, but, you know, we don't see, uh, I mean, with the exception of what's happening in Laos and a little bit in Mongolia, uh, basically we, we don't see uh, concerns about the sustainability of most of the countries in the region. Now, going forward, we had argued before that committing to future reforms, now it's hard to undertake reforms during a crisis when more spending is needed, but committing to future reforms is probably the right way to go. And then also uh, committing to say fiscal rules is something that countries should think about and uh, basically make clear plans that very transparent plans about uh, where they stand and even if they had to temporarily suspend those fiscal rules they should be clear when they are bringing them back and that will help uh, with their credibility and in the in the financial markets and make them more sustainable Thank you uh, very much for uh, your response. Uh, we received uh, one more question. I have a question about the Pacific Island countries. International tourism, particularly from developed countries, is getting back. Have the Pacific Island started taking advantage of it uh, for recovery, or would it require more time to see positive impact? Thank you. Uh, that, that's, that's also an interesting question that, that has been that has been in our minds. So first, more generally, what's happening with tourism? And second, what's happening in, in the Pacific countries? So uh, tourism has been recovering, but it has been recovering slowly. Like if you look at countries like Thailand or the Philippines or other countries in the region, Cambodia, uh, tourism is, is basically a proportion of where it was before the pandemic. Some of it may have to do with, with tourists that come from China that still are facing constraints, but generally speaking, you know, it, it's, it's slow. Uh, surprisingly, one of the countries that is, uh, that is seeing tourism pick up almost to the levels that it had before the pandemic is Fiji. So, uh, that has not been the case in some other Pacific Island countries. And, and well, first there were, a few Pacific Island countries that were still struggling with the pandemic. I think it was Micronesia, Marshall Islands. I think the waves has receded now, but you know it's uh, this is very recent. Basically, they they through 2022 they had problems. But second, we we think it has to do a little bit with infrastructure of tourism, right? So uh, com companies like Fiji probably have, have a more uh, adept and uh, and ready infrastructure to for uh, tourists to come and go and, and pick up, whereas other countries have been hit harder and they were operating more on a small scale and they need a little more to, to pick up. But the one thing that you can do and they should do is basically to make sure that, uh, especially inside the economies, proper vaccination is conducted and the concerns about the, the spread of the pandemic are Lay to rest in those uh, small island economies where you can control it. And you can do this from vaccination. And actually, that's what Fiji did. I mean, on top of having infrastructure and relying on tourism and jumping to it quickly, they actually did a very successful vaccination campaign and were able to scale it up quickly and take advantage of that. And that really helped them. So, uh, 
as uh, now it's not just about getting vaccinated one time, as we see also like here in the US, you have to have first shot, second shot, first booster, second booster shot. So it's important to keep up with that, and it's important for the international economy, the international uh, community to support uh, vaccinations in these island countries. Thank you very much. Um, I received a comment uh, from uh, Professor Naoki Yoshino. So let me read uh, his comment and ask you to uh, come in with your final remarks uh, in general, and then I will wrap up uh, Samara. Uh, so let me read uh, Yoshino Sensei's comment. There will be three ways to make subsidies. One is to consumer, the second is to producer, the third is to the market, such as price control. Food, coal, loans, all need support. Which sector have been prioritized among three ways? Uh, best policy would be uh, better compared. So these are just uh, rather comment uh, from his side. Uh, but uh, uh, with that, I would like to ask uh, uh, Elgis to come in with your final uh, remarks. Uh, then we wrap up our seminar. Thank you, Elgis. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you uh, for for the question. Uh, now, it's it's a it's it's a hard question because. In, in addition to, to comparing about the, the, the ways that uh, the countries might uh, interfere to help consumers uh, with these price increases, you also have to take into account uh, wh whether, whether this will be like a short-lived spike in, in prices or whether it will be long-lived uh, long inflation. Now, now, as I said, according to, to uh, theory and according to what most simulations would show, is uh, targeting consumers directly and, and letting uh, the prices, uh, you know, not distorting price signals seems to be the most efficient way. It does not necessarily mean that this would be the best way in the short term, right? First, as I said, if you care about production and you don't want to disrupt production, then maybe subsidies to production are not as bad. Probably from an economist point of view, it will be better than price controls. But for the reasons that I outlined earlier, that you know maybe uh, disruptions get get uh, disrupted. Targeting is not good. Uh, fiscal costs are are basically too high to continue, uh, and also the credibility of the monetary authority is not good. Then uh, you know price controls might help. But if you keep the price controls for too long, so if you price certain commodities not at market price and not at cost. Uh, if you do it regulation, you end up creating shortages. And, and basically uh, worsening the security of, of, of the country uh, being able to, to, to get or to, to have uh, the particular good. If you do it through subsidizing prices directly, then again, it will have a fiscal cost if this go on for longer. So it, it's, it's maybe a little bit more art and science. So if the belief is there that these are short-lived, then you, know, you want to keep the credibility, to support the credibility of monetary authority and help them in a bit, not create too many disruptions. But if these are long-lasting, then governments should think of ways of better targeting and letting the price signals do their work for the economy. Thank and, you. Uh, and yes. oh, let, 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 me, let me add one more thing. Sorry about this. But this is an example from Japan. It was pointed to us uh, about some policies that Japan, I believe, did in the 60s, after the 60s and 70s. So when, they, when it was dealing with, with high energy prices, especially after the 70s. 
And this is something that unfortunately we do not discuss in the, in the update, but this is a forum to have such discussions. Also, campaigns to educate the population on the consumption of, say, fossil fuels, energy, or you know, other commodities are probably helpful and also effective ways to to deal at a very low fiscal cost with these increases in tandem with all these other measures we talked about. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Elgis. Uh, we had a pleasure of uh, having uh, Elgis Islamaj, senior economist in the office of the chief economist for East Asia and the Pacific of the World Bank, connecting us from Washington, sharing the uh, main findings of the latest edition of the East Asia and the Pacific economy update, which was just released last week. Elgis, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Koichi, and thank you, everybody. Great, thank you very much. Next week, uh, we'll be featuring a new report uh, titled Building Re Resilient Migration Systems in the Mediterranean Region, uh, subtitled Lessons from COVID-19. And this is going to be starting at 8 a.m. on Friday, October 14th in Japan Standard Time. And then uh, week following, uh, we start, uh, we continue uh, featuring the other regional uh, chief economist offices report uh, with the economic update of respective regions. With that, I'd like to uh, thank uh, you uh, for watching the seminar once again. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. See you next week. Thank you very much.